Um, so I'm going to now talk a little bit about my journey. Um, and so you hear a lot about journeys. Uh, like I said, I'm a primary care doc. 25 years ago, I started a program called the Community Asthma Prevention Program. That's me on the left. We host a summit every year. And then um, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, um, I became the Chief Health Equity Officer for the Center for Health Equity. Um, this is not a, um, one thing that you will learn in this journey. Very little things are given <laughs> to us. We have to work for it, and I'm not going to say that's just for black and brown physicians, but my experience is as a black physician. Um, very few things are, are just handed to you. So this was a lot of work. Really enjoy patients, seeing them. I've been focused on asthma. Anybody here have asthma? One, two, three, four. Okay. Did you see about four out of, four, um, one out of every four um, kids have asthma. So I wanted to see if that was true. But I'm going to just start off. Um, and look, these pictures you're about to see are of me when I was little. We didn't have digital photo. Okay, so these are grainy. But I just really wanted you to hear about my story, maybe, if I can get it to go. Okay, thank you. So unlike many of you, I was raised in a small town, um, which was predominantly white. We had two streets that were black. Uh, we stayed on our streets for the most part, except for my family was, um, my grandfather was a sharecropper, and he, is, he and his brothers put the, all their money together and moved to North Carolina. They were in Georgia. They moved to North Carolina and bought farm property. And because I was in a working poor community, most people being farmers, even though, <clears throat> you know, we had some racist um, issues, it was very much, everybody was poor, we were all working together, and we were all farmers. So my father and his family garnered a lot of respect because they had 60 acres of farmland. They had no money, like my mother used to say, we're land poor, no, we're land rich and dollar poor, but um, because of that, was really able to grow up kind of in a village. I'm um, the oldest of three siblings. My inspiration is the woman on, on the, your right, uh, my grandmother, she was a community nurse. She was, uh, based on her ancestral heritage, believed in herbal medicines. And she um, got her license to be a community nurse. It was called practical nurse back then. And she actually would take a wagon. She didn't drive and go uh, house to house and really uh, provide health and health care for the black community. The only time we called a doctor is if somebody was on their sick bed or you had a broken bone. Because, because Basically, we couldn't afford it. We didn't have, you know, there was no, at least for us, there was no uh, Medicaid. It was really paid. Um, you had to pay for your service. And because my family lived check to check, paycheck to paycheck, usually in a hole, <laughs> from paycheck to paycheck, we just couldn't afford it. So she really was my inspiration. I used to follow her around and ask, well, why did you do that, Urban? Why did you do that? And just really uh, began to think about healing and wanted to be a nurse for, for many years. <clears throat> so. Uh, like I said, I went to a small town, and um, I started out in a segregated school. And in the segregated school, I actually was bused, so it was the town over. Uh, once I became un or once we desegregated, I could actually walk to school. So that was what was happening in the South in many places. Um, I loved uh, my school, my first and second grade, but the segregated school. All the teachers were uh, black. All the teachers really which is motivating us. It's just such a positive environment. So it was something of a culture shock to start going to the segregated school where it's a very small percentage of us were black. Um, <laughs> my husband likes this story. Uh, in elementary school, my mother was always, my father was always the, the wise, kind of very considerate, thoughtful person. And my mom was always like the mother of him, right? You don't hurt my children. We're all dead, right? So she's very quiet until you talk, touch her children. So she's told us, don't start fights, but finish them. <laughs> so so um, I was in a, a, there was a bully. Everyone knew he was a bully in school. We're in the cafeteria. One black teacher followed me from my school. She was my first grade teacher, and I loved her, Miss McLean. I'll never forget her. And she, um, I was sitting across from this boy, and I, out of the blue, he just called me the N-word. Like for, I didn't say anything to him, I didn't do anything to him. He called me the N-word, and I had this spoon in my hand, and I threw it, and I hit him on his head. But uh, my mother, but, you know, then he starts crying, and then I start crying, and my, my teacher, the black teacher who was in the cafeteria at the time, came to me and said, 
what happened, but she knew me and she knew I wasn't a person to start fights. And I told her, and back then you could actually spank kids, and so he had a little spanking. It wasn't a lot, but it was a spanking, and she got fired the next day. So um, that was just the beginning of, of my journey. In high school, um, it was really nice in the sense that um, I was able to take all the AP courses, not many, but all that were, and had a lot of mentors who were really pushing for me. But one of my mentors really surprised me because she, um, she was my biology teacher, had invited me to her house, you know, it's a nice house and all of that. And uh, her son and I were in the same class and I thought he was a good friend. Um, and when I got into my school, Ivy League school, and honestly, I only went there because they had free uh, travel internationally. That's why I took this school, but we'll talk about it in a minute. But um, I, I, you know, I thought she was a friend. I thought she really cared about me. And when I got into this school, which I'll talk in a minute, my close friend said to me, well, the only reason you got this is because you're black. Your, your SAT scores weren't higher than mine. And I was like, well, how do you know my SAT scores? Because I never told you that. And so there had been this conversation. It was really uh, hurtful to me because this is a woman I really looked forward up to. And then um, I was in everything that you could be in. I was in a rural town. We had nothing else to do. So if there was a club, if there was a, anything to join, I joined. But at 10th grade, my mom told me I had to work. Um, so I went to work after school, a couple of days a week, and every weekend I worked. Um, and it was, it was normal for us. It wasn't like I felt um, that I was doing something extra. Um, but in 10th grade, uh, because I believe in gifted programs for one reason, because in 10th grade, I really learned that um, I could be a doctor. I wanted to be a nurse. I planned to be a nurse, and I go to governor's school, which is a gifted program in North Carolina. And we're going around the first day, and they're saying, what do you want to be, what do you want to be, what do you want to be? And so when it came to me, I said, oh, I want to be a nurse. And they said, the student said to me, so this wasn't a teacher student, says, well, you know you could be a doctor. I'm like, no, we have no black doctors. I mean, this is before Cosby, and I don't remember Cosby, but it's before Cosby. And I thought I'd never seen a black doctor, I never thought it could happen. But that was very pivotal for me, because at that moment, I said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, and so I wanted to just share, oh wait, let me, all right. So here are the lessons I learned. There are black doctors, I can be one too. My village gave me enough encouragement. I got very little outside of my village, and the, the encouragement I got ended up not really being true. Um, Again, going to government school was pitiful, and I always, my white friends were friends as long as they didn't think I was smarter than they, I didn't think I was smarter than they were. And that, when that, when the rubber met the road, that's when they stopped being my friend. Um, and then every time there was an open door, there was a program or something I could go in, I would always sign up for, and my mother would be like, oh gosh, what are you doing now? But you know, she never said no, she just found a way to help me do it. Uh, and other things, don't allow other people's ignorance to stop me. Just because they don't think I can be a doctor doesn't mean anything, right? We have to make sure that we know who we are. And, sec and lastly, but not least, um, my faith was really important to me. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and that really kept me through a lot of the hurdles that I went through um, as, a, as a student. And now in college, um, I went to Ivy League school. Like I said, I wanted a small school, and I just that year of uh, school counselor from New York happened to come to our school, and it was a big thing that she married someone who had divorced his wife to marry her, so nobody liked her, but I didn't know any better. And I was, I, saw, I was the only student that would go to her because everybody else had heard from their parents, stay away from her. And so she really kind of adopted me and really helped me work through all the mail I was getting after my SATs or PSATs. And so I said, I'm on a small school, I want to be a doctor, and I really wanted to stay in North Carolina. And she's like, well, you know, think about the school Dartmouth. I had no idea Dartmouth was in New Hampshire and it was cold, cold, cold. I never would have gone. But what attracted me was that it was a small school. They had second year requirement that you had to go to Europe. I was like, I'll never get to Europe unless I go to this school. Because in my mind, you know, small country girl, that's just, that's just a dream. And that's why I went there. But it was a major culture shock, it was cold. People in New England are different. Um, I decided to, to major in music, and it sounds like a weird thing to, to do, but um, one of the, and both my husband and I, I met my husband there, uh, we were told in pre-med that we were, this is our last chance to do anything else, right? Pretty much, like, this is it, so if you want to do something else, this is the time. Um, I was, uh, you know, I played the piano, I was a singer, so I, the music had always been in my blood, 
And I thought, I'm majoring in music, I'm gonna enjoy this, I'm gonna take my pre-med courses. And it turned out to work out for me. I won't say it was the, the easiest road to take, but I'm not sad on this side of it that I decided to do that. As you can see, I was also in a lot of uh, activities, but also had to work, and I worked every single, every single um, semester, never stopped. Um, and so <laughs> the first is that I should have, I should have asked for more scholarships, I should have applied for more scholarships. My roommate, who's from West Philly, um, she applied for every scholarship known to man, and she never worked for the four years. She had money. She would give me money. She's like, Tyra, you have money? I'm like, no, I'm fine. No, 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 let me help you out. And so, she, so just knowing, looking for those scholarships, I wish someone had told me to do that, because it was really, I was poor all of college. And you know, I hated uh, cafeteria foods, so you know, I ate what I could eat. Um, and also finding the right group to hang out with who had similar goals. I ended up hanging out with um, you know, people who uh, were motivated. They didn't all become doctors. My roommate became a doctor, but they didn't all become doctors. Also taking advantage of every opportunity. Like I said, I went to Europe. I was in Europe every weekend. I was on the train going to a different town. I was like, this may be, you know, for a country girl, this may be my one and only time. I'm going to do everything I can do while I'm here. I mean, fortunately, I've been able to go back, but for me in that moment, I just didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> the other thing is I should have appreciated my parents more. You know, we get out like, oh yeah, all that stuff they used to do to encourage me, now I have to encourage myself. So it's really important to encourage yourself. Um, and I should have taken biochem. So I was a music major. I, I barely squeezed in every, at the, now biochem is as a prereq, but at the time it was not. And I barely squeezed in everything I was supposed to do. And I actually doubled major. I ended up double majoring in, in, in education and music because I love the education courses as well. And um, when I got to medical school, it was like, you know, it was like, that was a stupid decision. I should take it back. <laughs> uh, but my faith really kept me going down the path to medicine. And then in medical, uh, medical school, another culture shock. I went back down south to North Carolina. It was so much overt racism from day one. I was like, really? This is 19, I won't say when, but let's just say way past, you know, the Brown versus the Board of Education, way past uh, desegregation. And the fact that they just felt very, very um, comfortable in being so obviously racist was just amazing to me. So what happened when I got there, one of my, a person who ended up being my good friend said, hey, I'm adopting you. She's a black girl. And what I found out from her, she was repeating her first year. All five black um, students a year before me were failed and had to repeat. This woman had major in biochem. She was a witch. She's the reason why I got through biochem. And she had failed. But they made a decision that this was never going to happen again. So they adopted the black students. And they made sure if we were having trouble, they were meeting with us, they were studying with us. And I really give them a lot of credit for being able to overcome that. Um, also, I got married, and then I got pregnant, and then I had a kid. <laughs> um, and I will say that that was a hard, hard time in my life. And one story of, uh, of uh, one of the things. So this was an overtly racist uh, environment. And so when I got pregnant, I went to tell student affairs I'm pregnant, da, 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 and they said, well, it's hard enough being black here and graduating. Being pregnant, you might as well just forget it. I mean, they actually said that to me. Those kinds of statements make me mad, and it makes me ready to prove them wrong. So even though it was hurtful at the time, it actually gave me the strength I needed to pursue. And so right after that, two other white women got pregnant who did not, uh, weren't even married but for, for whatever reason, but they made a big deal about me and made no deal about her, and they, or about them, and then they changed their whole thing. So that originally, they're like, you're not gonna graduate on time if you take those six weeks off to be with your baby. And I can graduate on time. And then they changed everything because they realized they couldn't treat them, give them the ability to actually graduate and not give me the ability to graduate. Um, so it was really a tough time for, for both of us. But one of the things that didn't happen is I didn't do sub internships. So usually in medical school, your fourth year, you want to do sub internship. You want to get out there, you want to get in the hospitals, you want to understand what it's like. And it gives you a leg up when you apply for residency. And I just made a decision that my baby did not ask to come here. And I was not going to be rotating all over the, the you know, the, that part of North Carolina while, and doing sub internship for her. Because it meant nice on call, outside of what I had to do anyway for my clinical rotations. So I made a decision not to, which really probably impacted 
where, I, where we uh, ended up matching, which actually worked out for us. Uh, but having black colleagues who were transparent and willing to help us was pivotal. Uh, and my, responses, my response to racism was to work harder. And the other thing is I had to forgive them. I didn't do that right away. But I realized that forgiveness was for me, uh, not for them. I wasn't forgiving them to let them off the hook. I was forgiving them because I don't want to be bitter and I didn't want what they did to really color how I thought about myself. And lastly, it was okay to, to prioritize, prioritize my family. I think that's it. Um, so take home messages. Your past is a part of you. Wherever you come from, wherever you are, it's always going to be with you. That's who you, that's who you start out to be. But your, front, your future is in front of you. Uh, there's nothing that you can't do if you really are dedicated and committed to that. You may have bumps. You may have detours. Things people might get in your face. But you can still pursue and, and do that. And then finally, you can do it. You can do anything that you really want to do. Um, and we are here to really today to inspire you and hear other stories, not just mine. Um, and actually, we have a historical figure with us today. So our historical figure is my husband, who's the first black cardiologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So he's going to tell you a little bit about his journey now. I, uh... I had a recent orthopedic injury and surgery, so I'm not very mobile right now. But yeah, that's me, and I do love her story, how when somebody calls you the N-word, you hit them with a spoon, which she did, made the kid cry. I love that story. I know it's different now. People might pull, might pull a piece on you or do something crazy like that. So I'm not recommending that you hit people with spoons, but you know how to handle your business. So yeah, I am. So first of all, I'm not, my wife said, you got five minutes. And that's a lot for me, because normally she knows I can talk and talk and talk. So I will take five minutes um, and just highlight, give you a brief highlight of my life. So I am the first black cardiologist, but more importantly, I'm the first doctor in my family. And you know, when you, you kids are, well, y'all kids to us, okay? So I apologize for that. You youngsters, what do y'all prefer to be called? Just you students, how's students, that? Students, yeah. Students. Um, if you're going to be the first in your family, it's going to be big. It's going to be big in your, your parents' lives, in your community's lives. And I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. So anybody heard of Newark? Anybody been to Newark? So back in the day in the 60s and 70s when I grew up, Newark was the, considered the worst city in America to grow up in. Um, the entire city, it was, it was rough. And my mom knew the importance of putting us, making us go to the library every two weeks. I don't think folks probably don't even go to libraries. You have so much information that you can access on your cell phone. It wasn't like that back in the day. So uh, she saw the importance of us reading and, and getting as much information as possible and uh, trying to keep us off the streets as much as possible. It wasn't all that successful because we were youngsters. We still hung out. And my path was quite different from most of the, the path of my friends. Um, I had a lot of friends who didn't make it out of Newark. But with a dedicated mother, four of her children, all four of her children were able to make it out. And I think in that wise, I may share something in common with a lot of you of growing up in an inner city. Parts of the city weren't so good, but we still made it out. My mother was brainwashed me as a kid and said, you're going to be a doctor. And it worked. I was about five years of age. And some of you might have a similar story of the parents telling you, you know what, I think you're going to be in the medical field. You're going to be a doctor or a nurse or whatever. It worked with me. And um, so my mother was the most important influence of my young life uh, until I got to college. And then uh, I saw this real pretty girl. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm falling in love. So my wife has been the, the second most influential, well, over the last I'm not going to say how long we've been married. <laughs> the most say, influential woman in my life uh, after my mom. And I credit her with, I mean, you know, she's, my, she's my rock here. But my original plan was to grow up in New Jersey, stay in New Jersey, be a doctor in New Jersey, specifically in North, go to college in New Jersey. And, and I know that's true for a number of y'all in terms of getting out and seeing something different. I used to work at Ben Franklin High School in an adolescent clinic, and I was just shocked by how a lot of the kids then 
just never really got out and saw something different. And I'm going to encourage you, you do need to get out and see, because this is a huge world. Um, I'm going to wrap it up quick, quickly. But the original plan changed when I got to Dartmouth. And I give my sister credit for saying, you're in Rutgers, you got admitted to Rutgers, you got admitted to Dartmouth, you're going to Dartmouth. I'm like, I don't want to go to Dartmouth, you're going to Dartmouth. Unfortunately, I met Tyler. And my life changed because of a new girl. Came back when we matched after residency training, we were actually, we got to Philadelphia as part of the National Health, Health Service Corps. So for four years, I was a pediatrician at 55th and Woodland in Southwest Philadelphia. But I knew that because of my love for cardiology, I knew that I couldn't do that for the rest of, uh, rest of my life. So I went back into training for three additional years. That may sound like a long time to y'all, but when you get our age, a year of training is nothing. Two years of training is nothing. I have a, um, one of our, my godson is uh, in the Columbia program, and he's doing a total of nine years of medical school and a PhD program. And he is, what, six years into this? He's quite into it, and he loves neurobiology, the study of the brain. And in the long run, I know it's, it's kind of hard to think that, wow, four years of medical school, three years residency training, and I did additional three years of cardiology. It seems like a long time when you're 16, 17 years of age. But when you're 30 and you've done it, and you've got an additional 30, 35, 40 years ahead of you, it's going to seem like a small segment in time, honest. I, I guarantee that. So this new career in cardiology opened doors. As my wife said, I'm the first one here. Right now, I'm still the only one here, black cardiologist at CHOP. But it has opened a life, a different life for me in terms of exposure to colleagues, to the science and practice of, of cardiovascular disease. I don't do surgery. I'm a dog, diagnostician, which means I figure out what the problem is and then either recommend a medical course of action or surgery. But in the process, I, I've done a lot of stuff We're going to exercise physiology, ultrasound. I think we have an ultrasound machine. If any of you at some point, we can look at the heart if you're interested. But it has taken me around the world. As my wife mentioned, we've been to Spain, but I've lectured in China. Uh, I got a State Department award in Bratislava, Slovakia. So it really has opened up my world, and, and that's what medicine will do for you. All right, so like my wife said, stick to it. It's, it will change your life outside of the fact, most importantly, you will be providing a service to your community. I met a young man today. He wants to be in the medical field because he's seen way too many people in his neighborhood not survive gunshot wounds, all right? And that's the right reason to me, all right? That's the right reason to get into medicine because you'll be a service to people, you'll be a service to your community, and you will make your entire family and your community proud of you, especially if you're the first. And thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Maya. Maya. Um, so we need. One person at each table to sort of be the recorder slash everything else for the group. Pick a team name and sort of your group representative, and then we'll go through some trivia um, in about one minute. So I'll give you some time to develop your name if you haven't done so already, and then we'll move on to playing the game. Okay, we got it. Okay, so red team is in the lead. Red team in the lead. Satchel's with a close second. Wait, before we move on to the second, who's from the Smith group? You don't know which group you're in? <laughs> who's, who's in the group that has Dr. Smith? All right, you guys are the James McCoon Smith group. Can you guys share like something about this person? Did you guys learn anything? General Surgeon. Born in Manhattan. Great. He went to the University of Glasgow, so trained in Scotland. And I think there were a couple people here who were interested in general surgery. So he was the first. African-American physician and general surgeon, just so y'all know wow. what we're learning about, okay? Wow, that's incredible. Cool, thank you, Smith Group.
already, we're going to have physician volunteers assigned to each group. They are going to take out the white coats and actually put them on you. So if you want to take off backpacks and jackets that might not go as well under white coats, we're going to take pictures of you all um, so that you will have your own individual white coat picture. And then we're going to move to the back of the room for a big group photo, OK? these little things that work so well is because Kiana has really spent time really just thinking about every single detail. So really appreciate her work with this. And I um, want to thank all of the volunteers, but also the students for hanging in with us. Like so you talk to us, you engage us, it's just so cool. So we appreciate that. Um, and then I think we just wanted to review the uh, path. Oh, if you have asthma or if you know someone has asthma, Please do that QR code and sign up for classes. I was at the Youth Summit today. Um, my takeaway from this whole event was it was amazing to see people that look like me and people from my community and how there are medical people, not just doctors, but people from all types of specialty, specialties that are just in the community. And knowing that they're there is just really inspirational and seeing everybody today was really nice. one-minded, be open to more opportunities, and just be more open. Um, another thing I learned was um, to not worry about the money, because like you'll be miserable, you know, just focusing only on that. You want to do, you know, have a job that you really want to do. It comes to everything.